The following is a special presentation of the Dustin Geek Podcast. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast with Aaron Camaro and Chris Sinza. Love of podcasting. It's time for the Decibel Geek Podcast. My name is Aaron Camaro, joined as always by the man with the smooth opinion, Chris Sinzak. How's it going? It's going great, man. I am excited for tonight. This is going to be awesome. We are locked and loaded and fully f- equipped with ammunition. <laughs> loaded for bear, is ready that, to rock. There's enough really bad puns. For, uh-huh. not, those aren't even puns, they're just bad references. Oh, yeah, that's even worse. Right. So how about today, man? Yeah, this is uh, this is exciting because uh, and a listener from the UK named Chris Hoskin is responsible for help helping us get together with this guest, and uh, we have Mick Sweet on the show today. Uh, of course, from the Bullet Boys, King Cobra, a lot of stuff. About uh, one of Aaron and I's favorite debut albums ever is uh, the, the, the Bullet Boys debut from t- 1988, 30 years ago this year. I feel like I was in my prime when this album came out. I remember buying it at the record store. Yeah, look and, at us uh, now. And it was uh, it was cool because. Chris got us in touch with Mick, and Mick got right back to me and just said, love it, sounds like fun, let's do it. Cool. And then uh, we have a cherry on top. Yeah, uh, man. You uh, When you sent me this message, yeah. I thought, Chris, you beautiful bastard. <laughs> you freaking genius. Well, I, I start doing my research on it, and then I'm like, oh, Toby Wright was one of the engineers on this record. Uh-huh. So I just text Toby, hey, haven't talked to you in a while, hope you're doing well, and uh, just letting you know we're going to be doing an uh, interview with Mick Sweeta about the Bullet Boys' first album, Any Memories, and he just said yes. And I said, well, would you like to come over and, and join us on the call? And then he was like, well, is Mick in town? I said, no, but we have a microphone for you if you want to come. Yeah. And then he was like, yeah, sounds fun. So Sweet. So you're going to hear from an engineer and the guitar player and uh, hear these guys catch up and, uh, of course, go you know go through all the songs and yeah. the circumstances and all the stuff you guys love. And we you, guys, know, you guys remember how well that worked out when we did it with Rachel Bolin and yeah. Michael Wagner. So I expect it to be just as awesome today. Fingers crossed. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we hope you guys uh, enjoy this. We love doing these Albums Unleashed episodes because they're so much fun for us, too. And uh, let's get to it. All right, here we go. Albums Unleashed, the Bullet Boy. Gave you out. Okay, so I gotta let the cat out of the bag. I have a, a bit of a surprise for you because uh, this person wanted to keep it a surprise, but a, a voice from your past is also with us. <laughs> you make it sound funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, hi, Mick. Who is this? How's it going, brother? It's good. Who am I talking to? Talking to Toby Wright. Oh, Toby, my boy. I just uh, <laughs> I just mentioned you by name because uh, way back when we worked together, I never realized that you worked with Chris Whitley, who ended up becoming one of my favorite artists. Oh, so, that's awesome. Yeah, one of my faves as your well. Fame has o- yeah, your fame has only grown around here. Excellent. I'm here to uh, induce a laugh. Or two. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you will. You'll probably you'll probably correct some things too. I don't know. You know, there's there's Mem- been a lot of beers that have gone down the tube since we did that record, so uh, you'll probably have to correct some things. Oh, no uh, worries. Yeah, Chris was just telling us that coming up in September is the 30 year anniversary of this album. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Wow. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Does it feel like yesterday? I'm that old. <laughs> oh, yeah. We all are, bro. Oh, yeah. It feels like another lifetime, you know? Obviously, this band getting formed was an interesting situation alone because it comes off the tail end of the final lineup of King Cobra at the time. And it's kind of similarity to how the Vinnie Vincent invasion thing happened where most of the band leaves to start another band. Just in, in a quick nutshell, how did it happen to where basically you guys – basically took off away from from Carmine. Were you the first one to go? 
Well, it's, I'm the wrong person to do anything in a nutshell, so you might want to interrupt and well, stop uh, me if I get too long-winded. It's all good. But, uh, what, yeah, what happened is, um, you know, King Cobra was sort of floundering at the time, and I could tell it was not going the right way because Carmine kept reaching out to all these other people, right, for help. And I was presenting songs, and, and they were kind of being superseded by, you know, guys like Gene Simmons and whoever else he was trying to contact in order to sort of revive the brand. So I just basically gave my notice. I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go start my own band or find something else to do. And uh, I approached Mark and Lonnie, but they were very reticent to leave. I mean, this was their big break, right? And this was their big band, and they, they didn't want to go back and, and try to start something from scratch. So I just said, all right, well, best of luck, and I'll, uh, I'll see you guys on the flip side. And I started auditioning players. Eventually, I, I guess they came around, and, and we connected and, and agreed to uh, start playing. And in fact, Dave, the guitar player in King Cobra, came along with us, and I think he spent a week at rehearsals, and uh, it wasn't really for him, you know, and he had other things going on personally. So uh, it ended up being um, the four of us. Mark had a drummer in mind, but he didn't work out, and uh, that turned into kind of a cluster. So we ended up getting Jimmy, and... Everything sort of took off from there. So, uh, before we get into the songs, though, I mean, were any of the songs on this on this Bullet Boys album already in the can for King Cobra, and they just got carried over, or was it all original? I brought Kiss and Kitty to King Cobra, and we actually there was a version of it somewhere. I don't even know if I have a copy of it. We ended up streamlining it for uh, Bullet Boys, mm. so that was probably one of the first songs we started playing. Okay, and who came up with the name Bullet Boys? Uh, well, we, uh, actually the original drummer, I hate to call him the original drummer cause he, he was kind of a screw up, but he, uh, he brought it up and we liked it and just sort of ran with it and had a good ring to it. So, so you guys formed the band and, you know, obviously get your songs together. So how did the, the record deal and the connection to Ted Templeman come about? Well, at one point, I uh, saw a guy from our merchandising company, King Cobra's merchandising company. I saw him on the strip one night, and he said, hey, man, I'm managing, and, uh, you know, if you get something together, I'd love to hear it. So I gave him a call when we had a few songs together, and he came down and saw the band and uh, was immediately uh, a six stricken with us. And uh, so he really helped us to get organized, and he reached out to a bunch of different labels, and at one point, we were rehearsing in L.A., and he had scheduled a bunch of people to come down. So a guy from Geffen came down and um, some some other labels. And uh, I was really excited that uh, Ted's sister, Roberta, was going to come down because I, you know, I've just always been drawn to Warner Brothers records for some reason. I think it was the palm trees on the old vinyl label. Yeah. <laughs> but we, uh, we ultimately got Ted down there, and he sat and listened to our songs. He said, oh let's just play i'll raise my hand if i don't want to hear anymore and uh as the old story goes he never raised his hand so nice. you know we went through everything and he said cool let's make a record guys awesome. and uh, that was really exciting but the other unknown story is that they were trying to revitalize reprise so they were making a push for us to sign with reprise at that time which may or may not have been better because obviously we probably would have gotten a little more attention but, you know, again, I, I just really wanted to stick with Warner Brothers. I felt that that would be a better fit for us, and turned out it was. Yeah. And, uh, well, Toby, what's your first memory of the, of these this, this group of guys coming in to record? Walking in the door of the studio, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. You know, just <laughs> bringing in the drums, and, you know, it was pretty much another session at that point in time because it was at one-on-one -on -one studios. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, it was I was the only guy there, so the band's just kept on coming through so yeah at that point it was just you know they were just another band and then all of a sudden here comes ted and jeff and the boys and i was like holy shit <laughs> i got something special here guys what the hell <laughs> right right on. <laughs> and i think you hadn't toby hadn't you guys just sort of finished up with uh, metallica or something at that point yeah i think we had just finished the and justice for all record because yours came out just slightly after right the did because uh, their 30th anniversary of Injustice is coming up in May, I think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yours is what, September? September, or yeah. So, yeah, just, I guess, right after. Yeah, that, dude. yeah. I, th I could just feel that the ghost of that record was just sort of 
hovering around all the time. It's funny. It's like looking at the, all the tapes and everything. Right, exactly. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we added it a lot of two inch on, on that record. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to, you know, hear people play a song all the way through at that point. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I love it. But, you know, it's so funny when you guys put, uh, I think you put a reel on at one point just to show us. It looked like a freaking strobe light with all the edits. It yeah, it was a, hilarious. As it went through, yeah, the, uh, totally. through the heads and stuff. <laughs> wow. Yeah. There were there was a lot of edits. It was a an interesting and mm. kick-ass record. Yeah, but, you know. So you're saying that, oh, yeah, that Jim, amazing, right? you're saying Jimmy Deanna didn't require three months of drum tracking like no, Lars did? No, no. <laughs> well, the, the drum tracking took a while. I mean, Jimmy was pretty green at the time. You know, I mean, yep. he's never done anything like that. And Ted is uh, is very rhythm focused, and and he sort of wanted to make his mark on on some of our songs. So yeah, Jimmy got thrown a lot of curveballs and oh, yeah. ended up having to shift gears a lot. So yeah, I would say the first month and a half we probably spent mostly getting drum takes you know and at that point the guitar was almost incidental i mean like if i didn't get it on one of those takes punching in get required you know some <laughs> serious groveling like oh my god please guys it's a freaking it's a clam let me fix it please <laughs> <laughs> did you guys do pre-production with ted yeah, but I barely remember it. I think for the most part we had, because like I said, we were rehearsing every day. We didn't, None of us did anything else. We just got together and played all the time. So I think a lot of it was done. We probably went to, uh, I wish I could remember that. I, I bet you everybody in the band remembers it but me. But yeah, we, I'm sure we ran through some stuff for a week and then, uh, you know, did a lot of it in the studio, which right. again, you know, I love as much as I love Ted, he's a superstar producer. So for him to sit there and completely revamp a song or a drum track in the studio at freaking two thousand dollars a day was nothing, you right. know. And meanwhile, we're just going like, "Oh my god, this is going to be so expensive." And sure enough, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not cheap to work with Ted Templeman, I'm oh. sure. Oh no, no. If he wants to take a day off or a week off, just kind of go in and, as he used to say, we'll pre-mix. What? <laughs> the fuck is I remember. How about, that, how, yeah. how about if we get freaking song recorded first? Um, you know, you've got ten songs on this record. Uh, I got to ask: Was there is? I mean, is this everything you came into the studio with, or were there several songs that didn't make the cut? I think we came into the studio with like twenty four songs. Wow. Some of those, I know. I know we were playing "Thrill That Kills" at that point, which is on the second record. Not much else, though. I think most of those songs went went away, and we wrote pretty much everything else new for the second record. Mm -hmm. Describe the the chemistry of the band as you guys go in to record this, because like this is the the big break and everything. Your own band, you're on a major label. You got a huge producer. Um, was it a good camaraderie at that point? This band was always sort of on the edge. In fact, there's a story that you know once the record was done. Warner Brothers said, well, that's great. We'll, we'll release it in like nine months. And my manager was like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. These guys will never make it that far. There will be no band in like two months. Wow. So wow. we've got to do something. We've got to get these guys out. I mean, it was there was acrimony over a bunch of different things. I know I, I got sort of pushed into doing like a 25% split on all the writing. I mean, I ended up bringing in like four songs. And so, you know, that wasn't necessarily a good deal for me and I ended up doing a lot of the work on the other stuff. So, you know, I kind of had to put some stuff in a box and put it on a shelf. But ultimately, we were just happy to be in there making a record and doing what we wanted to do. And it seemed to be coming out pretty well. Well, let's, uh, if it's okay with you, let's let's go track by track and just start start with the first one. Um, Hard as a Rock, was it known pretty early that this was going to lead the album off? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I don't think we really had any ideas about... Uh, how it was going to be sequenced mm -hmm. but uh yeah that's the tune that came about in my little apartment in hollywood and uh seemed to come together pretty quickly you know it seems to have uh, made its mark
that was one of the first songs that went out to the local station here, KNAC, a local hard rock station, and seemed to do really well on there once the album came out. Yeah, whoever sequenced it, that's a great way to kick off this album. That song's got a, just a hell of a punch to it and a, a great way to kick off an album like this. Yeah, I think it kind of stood out, out to, to Ted. You know, to me, I, I didn't really care. I mean, I, I didn't really go down the rabbit hole of sequencing because it could, it, it kind of drove me nuts, you know. I didn't, like, do you start out heavy? Do you start out a little lighter? Do you build these, <laughs> you know, do you blow everyone's head off right at the beginning? I don't know. It's just like I, just, I was happy Ted did it. Yeah. yeah, it's easier if he makes the decision than you guys, I'm sure. And certainly, he, you know, he had the experience. Yeah. 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 And it was funny, too, because I, for for whatever reason, Ted likes, like, a little more space between the tracks. And I remember listening to it, going, oh, my God, there's so much time in between these songs. I noticed you know, that's that That's another thing I would have done differently, right? But yeah. he's, you know, he used to say it would have been any better. Yeah, I had it on my it's phone. It's weird today. time to hear ten or fifteen seconds, or however long it is in between most of those songs. Right. And um, track two, which was you know, I guess the the hit single off the album, which is "Smooth Up in You." I was going to tell you a, a anecdote. One, one of my best friends from back when this album was new, he thought you that Mark was singing "Smooth Opinion." It's actually "Smooth Jalapeno." Smooth Jalapeno. <laughs> I like that even better. Smooth Opinion. A trippy tune. It's funny when that came to be. I, guess, I think Lonnie had the like the verse groove. You know, he just all he heard was like, and he, he said, "Man, there's something there. I just know it." And I thought, "Okay, well, let's put it together." So I uh, kind of came up with a, a B section and some changes around that, and, and uh, a chorus figure. And Mark had, uh, or Mark and Lonnie, I'm not sure which one had the idea for the uh, the chorus hook. But, uh, yeah, that came together in, in Lonnie's Garage, and it's the first single, and it fell flat on its face. Never got any legs, never did anything. People just didn't pay any attention to it, and our record was practically over. And we did the video, and nobody really expected anything, because like I said, you know, the first shot at the song was pretty much over. And uh, they gave us another chance, we did the video, and we go out to do these dates with Cheap Trick up north in uh, Wisconsin or something like that. And the dates with Cheap Trick were great. You know, we're still kind of bumming because it's like, holy crap, it's our record ever. You know, are we really done here? And we didn't know that there was even going to be a future. So we go to this club and I'm sitting upstairs practicing and I figured, great, you know, the place is huge. There's going to be 30, 40 people here, you know, another great time. And I come down to go to the stage at showtime and the fucking place is packed. And there's lines out the block and there's like no room for anybody to be in this club. And it's, it's a big club. And I'm like, Holy fuck. Do they, do they think someone else is here? I mean, this is weird. And, uh, you know, so we ended up playing the gig and come to realize that that was when the video had hit, right? People had been seeing this video and flipping out, but you know, the fact that that song, almost never saw the light of day is, is kind of funny. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, the, and that really shows the power of MTV at that time. I mean, they really could make a career, couldn't they? Well, they made ours. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, if we hadn't had that video and if they hadn't played it, I don't, I mean, I guess we had a two record deal or a three record deal or whatever, but who knows what would happen. And that video got, I mean, that, I, that was heavy rotation for that video. I, I, it was, felt like it was on every hour at one point. 
Yeah, over I guess overnight you guys just blew up uh, mainly from that song, and you did a video without Lewis Gossett Jr. telling you to do push-ups. I was impressed. Oh, <laughs> uh, you had to you had to get that in. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'm I'm glad that video did well because it was a freaking soul sucking shoot. Holy crap! We went for like 24 hours straight, and I'm in those cowboy boots, and so my feet were all fucked up and then just slept for like the next few days oh <laughs> wow um then we go to track three which is ode to joe what? Notice a few Aerosmith references in the song. Is the song about Joe Perry? Well, he's a reference in it, but um, I wrote the lyrics to that, and what I had in mind was just a general tip of the hat to everybody that came before us. You know, I mean, I I was I remember sitting at the pool of the Oakwoods, and I had to finish these lyrics because you know I guess we were going in the next day to to get the vocals on it or something, and uh, I just remember thinking, God, Guns and Roses is so huge right now, and you know, does anybody even know about John Hooker? Does anybody even know about Albert King? You know what I mean? All those blues cats that I have all the box sets of, and I fucking just love them. You know, it just made me feel kind of bad because, like, here we are, all these kids on the Sunset Strip, and ask somebody who freaking Muddy Waters is, and they'll just go, what? What band is what is he playing tonight? So, you know, I mean, that's just kind of where I was coming from with that lyric. Gotcha. Yeah, I just I picked up the train, kept rolling, and back in the saddle. I was like, is this about Joe Perry? Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, those guys were a big influence on me. You know, I, uh, I remember seeing them in Buffalo at the War Memorial Auditorium, and I was on the floor. Like, I'd never go on the floor for concerts, right? People are throwing M80s down from the top, and it's just a freaking mayhem. But, you know... It was just that's that was a rock show, I man. I'll never forget all that. And then so track four, shoot the preacher down. This is the one that I can hear more of the a Van Halen, it, kind of a hot for teacher vibe. I mean, were you guys going for that on that song, or just a boogie woogie up tempo track? Yeah, it was just a boogie woogie thing. I mean, that's that's one of Jimmy's fortes. She uh, he did a great job on that track, and uh, we sort of put it together. You know, I mean, that was one of the things that we did. We sort of tried to play to each other's strengths, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I think that was more of a sort of communal writing thing. But uh, that's a good tune. I, I like the planet. Dear men watching late night TV, he saw a scared man came up to me and said, Hey man, I take my hand. Look at him. I said, No, 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 mister, please. You can't bring a bad boy to his knees. Got a subtle way to say good out of town. Shoot the preacher down. At the time, you know, that lyric, we were worried about it, or at least I was worried about it causing problems, you know, because it was uh, a much more innocent time, even by today's standards back then. So, you know, and I've been with King Cobra where people were protesting the shows, and it was kind of a tough thing to have to worry about that kind of stuff, but Mm. we didn't have any trouble. It was all for naught. Yeah. So if you get away with smooth up in you, how, how more offensive do you expect us to get? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wait a minute, if you're going to gripe about shooting a preacher? Listen to this. Smooth jalapeno, man. <laughs> 
there is, you know, there's a fair share of sexual lyrics on here, but there's also a lot of stuff that's not, which of course that was kind of standard stock and trade for, for the hard rock bands in was just write everything about sex. I mean, you guys got into some darker material. I mean, do you think that, do you think that helped or hindered you guys? Well, I know that, uh, when we got darker on the second record, people didn't like it, but yeah, I mean, I, I've read the reviews where people are, you know, and if you want to see the worldview of this band, just listen to Kissing Kitty, and that'll tell you everything you need to know. But, you know, I mean, that's why, like I was saying earlier, people just make these global judgments, and they hear one thing and decide the whole record and the whole band's career is that. So it's just easy, lazy journalism, you know, for the most part when that happens. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I at that time, I was in my H.P. Lovecraft days, and so I... I always was pushing for the lyrics to be a little more substantive than, than that, you know, than just pure sex all the time. Although pure sex all the time is actually a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> True. It's positive. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's get into, uh, for the love of money, the OJ's cover. I mean, uh, uh, definitely a strange song to cover, but you, and, and not an easy song to cover, but I, I think you guys did an awesome job on this one. Well, thank you. Well, this is uh, this is another one that Mark is, has a tendency to revise history on. He uh, he likes to claim credit for for this song when, in actuality, uh, I demoed it for him in King Cobra in my little place in Hollywood. And uh, the way I laid it out was, you know, there wasn't really a backbeat. It was just like you know, down, 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 you know, without uh, what you currently hear. But he never ended up singing on it. You know, he never was interested in doing it, in spite of what he says. So at one point during the making of the record, Ted is like, Nick, we're, we're going to need some other tunes. What? Give me a tape. Let me see what else you've got going. Standing there listening to it with him, and that tune came on. And I reached over to like fast forward it because I didn't I didn't want to hear something without a vocal. And, and he goes, Whoa, 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 whoa! What is that? Let it play. And he listened to it, and he's like, Oh my God, what a great idea! Let's this is amazing. And I thought, oh, fuck, great. Now these guys are going to be pissed at me because it's going to do a song that I took and demoed a long time ago. So, and that's the kind of stuff that I had to worry about. But anyway, obviously Ted held sway over it and uh, he sort of transformed it into a, you know, a groovy kind of thing. And obviously Jimmy did a great job on it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he just launched his bass and all that. And I know the <laughs> mixes were finally done. The, uh, the consensus was like, this is so great because it'll blow up people's speakers with the bass so loud. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, Holy fuck, really, good. I remember that. <laughs> that's our crown. That's our crowning achievement. Right. Yeah, there there are guitars on it too. I'm not sure if you guys are aware. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this song, uh, "For the Love of Money," being a single? Were you cool with that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, cool with it. I, I just wasn't. You know, I was always sort of reticent. Like I said, you know, I, this this record didn't. Uh, didn't exactly come out as I had heard it in my head. So I, uh, you know, I was just hopeful and optimistic, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was hoping that it, it would have been huge, although I didn't really want to be known as a cover band. You know right. what I mean? Like I, I was sitting, saying to myself like, Oh, great. This will, this thing will be the smash and we'll be known as the guys that covered the OJ. <laughs> so in, in my heart of hearts, I would have preferred that to be one of our songs, but, you know, I also wanted the record to keep going, too, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, if it helps bring them, you know, slightly new audience, I'm always happy to be a part of that.
want to be a member of the Decibel Geek Army? You slimy scumbag, get on your face and give me 25. Join us on our fan page at facebook.com slash decibel geek. We love you long time. We got to talk to you guys real quick because as you know, Rockin' Pod Expo 2 is coming up in Nashville, Tennessee on August 25th. We've got some big names we've already announced. Mm -hmm. We've announced all kinds of cool perks throughout all the amazing podcasts that are a part of the Rockin' Pod Expo 2. And, you know, it's really shaping up to be something special. And I know that there are a few more special guests that are ready to be announced. Now? Now. Oh, man. This is about as cool as it gets because Vinny Vincent is coming to Rock and Pod Expo 2. Yes. Feels so good to say it. Vinny freaking Vincent is coming to Rock and Pod 2. He certainly is. August 25th, Nashville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Vinny Vincent is going to be there. You know, we're all excited about August 25th and we're all excited about Rock and Pod 2, but mm-hmm. before we get to all that, we've got to make it happen. Yes. And the only way we can make it happen is with the help of our friends out there in podcast land. Yes, all the people that love and listen to the Decibel Geek podcast every single week. You know, it's a free podcast. We give it to you absolutely no charge every single week. Go to Rock and Pod 2018 on GoFundMe. On GoFundMe. Okay, yeah. so you go to GoFundMe and then you look up up rock n pod mm-hmm. 2018. 2018 simple i think you're gonna enjoy it it's gonna be a good time and yes we have some big names being announced soon So uh, Kiss and Kitty is next, and how much does the final version differ from the uh, the demo you had done for King Cobra? That was a song that I brought into King Cobra, and, and the guys didn't really care for it, so it's just kind of got put on the back burner, even though we uh, even though we recorded it. Like I said earlier, you know, Carmen at that point was was reaching out to other writers. And he, we did a couple of songs from Kiss, and it was just getting so weird. So I just felt like I could take my songs and run. Mm-hmm. And uh, ultimately, we ended up just sort of streamlining it from the version that I did in King Cobra. So it's just a lot sexier and a lot meaner and, and uh, much cooler, I think, on our record. <laughs> definitely a cool song and you know one thing that we've kind of been you know has been coming up over and over again through this conversation is the rhythm section of this band you know and i obviously it takes some work to get this sound but man the bass and the drums are just unbelievably powerful on this whole album you know the whole thing has just got a a certain boom to it and this song really kicks ass at the time obviously we like i said we were a pretty new band and, and it was there was a lot of other stuff going on but that chemistry that you're talking about has sort of prevailed over everything the three of us have done you know and and to this day i mean we're we're in a band now called lies to see treachery which Mm -hmm. we'll reference later and the three of us all get together and agree like we can't play like that in any other situation we've ever been in and when the three of us get together there is a bona fide chemistry that can't be reproduced like I said, I may not have been as aware of that, at, you know, in the making of that record and the maelstrom that it was, but uh, it's it's undeniable. You know, I mean, I'm not just saying this, you know, of my own accord. I've heard it from other people, and I see it, you know, practically in every day on Facebook posts. So, you know, yeah, there's there's something there that is so visceral and organic, and you know, it's a shame when we're not playing together. So, you know, I'm glad we're back and. 
I'm glad that record ended up coming out and getting the life that it did. And I love playing with those guys. Jimmy and Lonnie are uh, soulmates in every sense of the word when it comes to having something that you can't find anywhere else. I certainly haven't been able to. Awesome. Yeah, it's good stuff. It shows. And the um and it and then that's real evident on uh, Hell on My Heels yeah. track seven. This song is just it's just intense and uh it's got a great groove to it and the layered vocals, like the way the the vocals are produced on this this song is really impressive. Well, thank you. Yeah, that um that tune is it came about I think in uh sort of group way, you know, there were some of those songs were just us kind of sitting in a room and hashing things out. But I remember um, that we did not have a chorus for that tune in the studio, you yeah. know, and Ted was like, Nick, you got to go away and you got to come back over the weekend with a chorus for this tune because it's not working the way it is. And I don't even remember what it was, <laughs> but I had this idea of sort of getting that dissonance, you know, and uh, he liked it. Let me think, how's it go? You know, I just, threw that out there as an idea for the chorus and it was like yes let's go mm -hmm. and uh, that kind of finished it up you know <laughs> It's a really cool song, and they have the the the, the chorus. Vo uh, it, that, the chorus is one of the strongest parts of the song, but that's so that's interesting that that kind of came last, you know, when it when it was being made. Yeah, I mean, everything else was done, and and certainly, you know, back then, Mark really could hit those notes and had those pipes. You oh know? yeah, I think he impressed a lot of singers at the time. People were were hearing what he was doing, and like, holy fuck, who is this guy? You know, for so sure, mm -hmm. it, uh, it was impressive on that level too. Well, yeah, there's times where I listen to this record and my throat hurts listening to some of the yeah. stuff he was doing. I'm just like, God, how does he not shred his throat in half doing that? But yeah, like I've always said, I'm I'm glad he's doing it. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it's uh, it, well, it, did he have to do a lot of vocal takes at the time to, to hit these to do these uh these songs? Uh, I wasn't uh, at the actual sessions, but I can tell you from my working with Mark, no, he uh. Singing like that, there's there's no way you can do more than three, you know, yeah. before you start to burn out. So um, I would venture that if he went in with Ted and did three solid takes through and then, you know, punched a couple of things here and there, tried to sing extemporaneously, mm -hmm. that would be it. I, you know, Mark's not that guy that's going to go in there and do six different takes and they're going to come from there. He's If he hasn't gotten it in the first three, yeah. it's we'll try it another day. So yeah, I don't think I there was too much it. of that at all. Yeah. 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 I remember it like that as well. You know, two or three mm -hmm. takes and that was it. And comp them. I suppose. And he, yeah. You know, he was a do? talented singer, man. He could fix oh, yeah. pull shit out of his hat, you know, and, and usually on that first take, he's going for it. You know, he, he wants to get it. And, uh, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if, you know, the majority of that record is, first take material you know right wow nice so then you go into crank me up uh any particular memories of the making of this one <laughs> the funniest story i can think of that too is that ted had this crazy idea he was going to bring in he wanted to vibe up the people at the, the label so he brought in a bunch of people and he's like okay you guys i want you to play you're going to play the song and i'm going to just do some funky stuff in the, in the control room but you guys just keep playing right don't don't fuck up so he's got all these people who are doing Crank Me Up. And, uh, you know, there's that one at the beginning, you know, like, gah, 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 and drums come in. And then we stop on this. It's like a C flat five with a D in it, you know? So I don't know, C flat five two or whatever the fuck it's called. I don't know. I just like it. I can't, don't ask me to name it. But we <laughs> land on that chord, right? And I freaking clam it. He goes, hey, Mick, 
are you all right, brother? Did that hurt? I'm like, you fucker. We'll just do it again. Just roll. Will you? And enough with, the, enough with the cuties. Just push some freaking buttons in there, will you? Awesome. <laughs> And that song's pretty adventurous, guitar playing wise. Like you said, there's like almost some jazzy style chords you're playing in that. Well, and, and that's another tune that, like, when we demoed it, we, we did our demos with Garth Richardson, who mm. I love to death. Good, 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 Garth. And uh, <laughs> you know that tune again on those demos. You know, it's like doubled on each side, and the leads over the top of it. It's you know, it's even freaking crazier. So. Again, you know, it was almost like that in the playback. It's like, holy crap, man, our demo is so much more guitar-y, you know? Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, it's that's how it should have been. I mean, when you heard us live, it was much more akin to, you know, that record than anything else. So right. that, that was good. And then Badlands, this song stands out from the rest on this album. It almost has its own atmosphere to it. I mean, I really like it, but it... it, it, it it almost sounds like something a completely different band would have done. What's the story with that song? Well, you should have heard the original demo that I brought. Cause I, I brought that song to the band and it was, I mean, it, it could have been a Dio song, you know, the way I wrote it. <laughs> so Ted just, you know, I guess he had that feeling too. And uh, once we got in the studio, he just kind of started transforming it. And, uh, you know, it felt good all the way through. I mean, it, it had more of a sinister, edge maybe by the time we were done and and uh you know i think it, it suited the song very well ted had, had very good instincts you know he never was interested in taking any writing credit and, or anything like that you know i mean he just liked to play with arrangements and, and like to hear things in a different way and you know it was a, a lot of fun in that regard you know as, as long as he was making everything better we were all good with it so that's an example of of something that uh yeah really kind of got transformed in the studio. cool man well and then uh, you close out the album with f sharp nine um how does the song get its title well uh it basically came because i couldn't think of of anything cooler than the lyrics to name it you know i did i think at, at the time that, that i was working on that chorus i actually did put a nine in the chorus i don't think it exists anymore now it's just kind of an absolute honor
But yeah, as crappy as that story is, that's really how it seems to be. But uh, you know, I really love that lyric. I had a good time uh, writing that, and as I referenced earlier, the last line in the song, as as we're done vamping and the, the song is crashing to an end, that lyric is what we're going by now. As uh, Jimmy and Lonnie and I sort of readdress those songs from those days and playing our new band. You should be able to catch us uh, hopefully in a town near you soon. You can hear all that stuff at 19 or, what? Well, hold on, what, is, what year is it? 2018. <laughs> 2018. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm that old. And still, hey, yeah, I know, I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to get out awesome. there and hopefully we will pretty soon. That'd be great. Killer. So who, cool, who's man. singing for Lies, Deceit, and Treachery right now? Well, we just did a Monsters of Rock cruise with Andrew Freeman, mm -hmm. who is an amazing cat, an amazing singer. He did these songs so much justice, it was a joke. So, um, you know, we're looking forward to working with him, schedules permitting. Um, you know, we'll see how, how everything goes and how everything pans out. But again, you know, I can't emphasize enough how fun it is to play with Lonnie and Jimmy and, and uh, breathe new life into these songs. You know, we're having a great time and there's no drama and no buffoonery out there, and it's just it's a whole lot of fun. So, mm -hmm. hopefully, uh, we'll get to play these tunes for you guys, and you can give me your own opinion. That, that would be great. Um, and how many of the tunes uh, from this album do you play live? We play them all. Oh, we played yeah. every song on this record. I think that was like you know what we set out to do, and then obviously we sprinkled in some stuff from the second record as well. So yeah, I mean there it is. That's awesome. That is cool, man. Well, man, this has been... Yeah, a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. I'm, I'm just... I love you guys so much, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun, you know, and it's cool to revisit these albums the way we do, you know. We always pick the choice albums to do, and, you know, the... the Bullet Boys debut album, I know Chris and I both agree, you know, mm -hmm. it, it had a big impact on our lives as young fans, you know. Obviously, it's had a good impact on Toby's life because it made him feel like he was going on rock and roll vacation after what he'd been through. Fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully I didn't pop any balloons, you know, because I, I, when I talk, I just try to stick to the you know, to the truth and, and hopefully there's some funny stories and hopefully people, uh, I think people respect, you know, hearing things that, that they might not necessarily have known. And, right. you know, you, you have to hear the whole story to really, uh, appreciate everything that went on back then. So like I said, hopefully I didn't, uh, bust anybody's bubble, but you know, there it is for better or worse.